Hi. Uh, I thought I would be reading for my first book uh, that I may have wrote, but I forgot it in my room, so I'll be reading something else. Um, so I'll be reading from a work in progress. It's a voice-driven novel told in vignettes, um, exploring a dysfunctional family and undiagnosed neurodivergence through the lens of gods and monsters. So here's short for vignettes. Meet Dino, short for Dionysus. My father's monster. Whereas my brothers were born in the natural way, gnawing on the bones of my mother, ticking the storm shutters of her rib cage, I was birthed from a boil on my father's inner thigh. He thought me nothing the first trimester but an ingrown hair, an easy mistake. Only my mother caught glimpse of what I truly was, scarcely more than a mouth. She knew my father would plunge a knife into his own leg if it would prevent me from becoming what I would become. So she hid me, and he, believing she lanced a lump of me, applied a frozen chuck eye to his sore. She told my father, hold this here until it thaws. This is the most my father ever did to help my mother make dinner at home. As the meat softened, I burrowed deep into its muscle until I hit a marbled pocket. Before frying the steak, my mother pressed the fat that housed me to her own stomach and whispered, it's okay. What, my father hissed from a table in another room. She said, your dinner will be ready soon, I yelled. But my father couldn't hear me, for my mouth was full. Another human bot fly at my mother's womb. My mother's monster. My mother's monster came home so tired, he sank into his armchair as soon as he walked in the door, boots clumped with mud, cement, tar. Take them off, he would say to no one. My mother would take them off. Then he would say, crack my toes. But what he meant, and we all knew this, was take off my feet. He would take off his feet by unscrewing them at the ankle like a light bulb. As he slept, my mother would pull each toe until it snapped like something being broken or a thing clicked into place. Peeled socks haunted the ground like the shed skins of a beetle. The back of his heel so calloused it resembled a hoof. Instead of replacing them, my mother would hide the monster's feet so that he would have to walk like a man on stilts. The only danger was within his embrace. He roamed the house, not quite speaking, like some creature sutured together, capable of love, had he been made of his own parts. Mushroom Girl. What you saw was merely the fruiting body, but she was so much more than a body fruiting. Her hair grew out more than her shoulders, below her knees, below her feet, below her everything, tendrilled the earth like an expanse of fiber optic networks, such that she could feel information, could feel men approach her. I'm not even touching you, her annoying brother would say when she would complain to her mother about being stepped on. It's like I can feel the whole neighborhood, like I'm a big stupid map or something. That's nice, mija, was all the mother said. I think I'm sporing. That's nice, mija. I said, I think the gills around my neck are getting too fat. It feels like a yoke. Yes, mija, that's a nice necklace. Just make sure to cover your chest. Boys only want one thing. Excuse me, this girl also only wants one thing, but who cares? No one asked, just like the boy who didn't ask, tried to snap the band of what he thought was her bra. Oops, his bad, because what snapped was her mind, which is to say her whole damn body, because she was mycelia, and like a dandelion, kicked in the head, the girl kicked in the head, vanished like a wish up the nostrils of a boy. She possessed like a hand commands a glove. The boy now followed her headless torso and like a puppet with her hair, not a marionette strung up by ropes of hair, but a true puppet she maneuvered from the inside. She possessed the boy as a doll shaped by the interior wire of will. Now when she came home to brother, home to mother, when she spoke through the boy's cadaver, 
the mother looked right into his eyes, which were really her eyes, listening to the daughter talk about her day. And when she said, he said, no Brussels sprouts for dinner, she still said, that's nice. Miha, but now she obeyed, throwing the little heads of cabbage into the trash with the water and the pan and the brother. And in this way, the mother also became the girl's puppet maneuverable through the boy she maneuvered with her hair, which wasn't love. No one said love, but given her condition, it was all a girl like her could ask, ask, ask. My teacher's monster. My eyes were the sticky color of buckwheat honey and her eyes were the color of precious stones. Try as I might, I could never keep them to myself. And my teacher would say, he who hath touched his neighbor with his eyes has already touched them with his hands. As punishment, she would call me to the front of the class and I knew what to do. I stooped over my teacher's open palm. With her free hand, she slapped the back of my head with a yardstick. Thwat, my eyes dropped from their sockets one at a time like a machine fed with quarters. You can have them back when you learn to behave. When you learn to behave like the other children was what she would say with her second mouth. I knew this because I learned to see with my ears. To make the other children laugh, my teacher would command me, read this passage out loud. And when I did, for I had memorized the entire book word for word in anticipation of just such a moment, she would say, stand at the back of the room. I stood at the back of the room as if facing a firing squad or an optometrist. She held the book out and said, now read the bottommost line. I can't, I would say. To give the appearance that my mind had complied, I lied. That's right, she said. I would fail all of my classes this way, but would ace the final exam. It's not fair, the other children would say. He's cheating. I could do that too if I didn't have eyes. And so by the time my teacher would return what was mine, it was too late. The children were already shaving their yellow pencils, wearing burlap sacks over their heads. Thank you. And next, please help me welcome River Adams. Hi, everyone. How is this? Um, I'm River Adams. Um, I'm going to read a little, um, a few pages from uh, my novel, The Light of Seven Days. All you need to know is that the protagonist is a Russian Jewish dancer uh, who escapes from the late Soviet Union and becomes a refugee in the United States. And this is just like the beginning of her being here. It's the, the last time we saw her, she was on the plane to America. It began in the calamitous sixth century before the common era. Jerusalem had been reduced to rubble by the hordes of Babylon. The temple stood in ruins. And those who survived the siege were carried off to slavery on the shores of the Euphrates. For 50 years, three generations in those times, they mourned their fate in exile, singing psalms that dripped with languid, venomous blood, having visions of their fellow land and of God's grandeur and mercy and wrath. There was only one choice back then for the worshipers of a defeated God, convert or die. But they were stubborn. They were arrogant and faithful, and they refused. Your God is weak or indifferent, the Babylonians said to the Jews. Our God is stronger, convert. No said the stubborn Jews, our God is Lord. If he brings us low, it is only to teach us a lesson for idolatry or for iniquity. Our God wields your armies as his teaching tools. He is not just a God, he is God. And so the Jews invented a new exile-compatible Judaism. 
Away from the temple, they found refuge in the Sabbath. In the Torah, they found the reconciliation they could no longer offer through blood sacrifice, and they tasted every letter on their tongues as if it were raspberry colored. They circumcised their sons with pomp and ceremony because the ark had been lost, stolen, or destroyed by the barbarians, and now they carried the covenant in nothing but flesh, a privilege and a responsibility. From then on, it would become a display of courage, too, for the flesh doesn't lie and doesn't convert. And in the big, brutal world where Jews are slaves, you cannot hide who you are. They didn't hide. They pulled out of their scrolls and put on display the laws of dress and laws of food and laws of speech so their children and their neighbors would know they were Jews. They were Jews. They were Jews. They called themselves the remnant. Prophet Isaiah called them the children of exile. In Hebrew, B'nai Hagolah. I'm reading about the Babylonian exile in the Encyclopedia of Jewish History because my sponsor in synagogue here in Philadelphia is called Temple B'nai Hagolah. And I made the mistake of asking Zev Alterman what it meant. I pointed at the sign by the sidewalk stylized letters between two Magin Dovids, which they call Stars of David, and tried to form a sentence, but it took too long, and I probably said it wrong, too. Doesn't matter. He smiled, he nodded, he and his wife both gestured enthusiastically. I'm sure he was giving me a thorough answer related to something, of which I understood exactly three words. You, out, and inspired. Putting together my reading and a few other words I've collected so far from the Americans, I suppose he may have been saying they were inspired by their synagogue name to get someone like me out of the hellhole that is the Soviet Union, or he had no idea, and my question inspired him to figure it out one day, not soon. Or I was annoying him with stupid questions, and I should get out and take a hike to a place called Spireb. I often think I hear one word when they are saying another, or two words together, or several. Can and can't, for instance, sound exactly the same, don't they? If Rabbi Fromm asks me to recite the Torah backwards in Hebrew, and believe me, I'm constantly terrified that he will, how will he know if I can or can't? When I have to tell the two apart, I rely on accompanying body language, and when there isn't any, I gamble. Throw a coin in my head. Tend to land on the wrong side. I call that my opposite degree of accuracy. English to me is a soft, gooey mouthful of porridge through which they're trying to push out some meaning. It must consist of words, at least as they intended, but everything is slurred and swallowed and stuck together like paste, incomprehensible verbal vomit. I would bet they just pretended to understand each other if I didn't see them follow commands and laugh at jokes and nod at something in unison. Amen. Recently, I've started picking out a word here and there, one for every few sentences, yet I'm still effectively mute. A week ago, I tried to contribute to a post-service chat I thought I'd grasped enough of to surmise that Mrs. Alterman was complaining about congestion on Roosevelt Boulevard. I caught road, or roads, traffic, Roosevelt, and possibly tire, although that would have been tired. But by the time I formulated my pitiful three-word statement of agreement, decided to add very, and calculated where to embed it, they'd already moved on, apparently, and I blurted it out of context, out of order, and irrelevancy. They stared. They smiled the way they smile at me, kind and disinterested, the way you smile at a child who inserts herself into adult conversation. It's cute when they're curious, isn't it? They asked me something the way they talked to me, loudly. But cranking up the volume doesn't help me parse, and I still didn't know what they wanted, so I, start, I stared back at them and smiled the way I smile at them, 
idiotic looking, I imagine, and lost, hiding fear and hatred under a thin veneer of gratitude, not a child, a dog in a cage. I really don't hate them. I really am grateful to them. They're nice people. It's a very American word, nice. One of the first words I've learned right after OK. <laughs> they use it every few minutes. They use it for everything. And it means a person or a thing or a deed that offends no one, stands in the way of nothing, has no sharp corners and no hard surfaces. A plush blanket is nice. A cup of herbal tea, a picture of a kitten. A gun is not. But then, neither is a syringe. Nice won't save your life, but it'll hug you and make you feel better. Nice isn't the same as good, not the opposite of evil, but it's a value in this violent world. It has a place. Because nice is peace and warmth and consolation, a white lie when you can't take any more truth. Nice is charity. Come to ponder it, religion is nice, isn't it? Afterlife and heaven and the rising of the dead, the utmost white lie for the weary soul. Marx called it the opiate of the masses, the ultimate self-delusion, self-defense, self-medicating the pain of living, available prepackaged from a house of worship near you. The Jews of Babylon would die without the consolation of God, so they believed the nicety that would save their nation. The Jews of Philadelphia are nice enough not to have asked me if I believe it. At least, I don't think they have. But they're good people too. The children of exile who wanted to help another in exile. They offered to sponsor whatever random person needed them and they accepted me and embraced me and never required that I prove my worth or my piety, though I'm afraid they assume I have both. They are salt of the American earth, these people. Nice, good, pious, Jewish, American, generous, all around, perfect, plush and blanket-like. No one twisted their arms to babysit a clueless, penniless refugee who is as useless as an infant in their noisy world. Their religion inspired them to. Was it religion? Please welcome Gen Del Rey next. Okay. Uh, am I am I talking loud enough? Yeah, everyone can hear me. I, I have a ten I have a soft voice, so if at any point I start, you know, being too quiet, please someone tell me. Um, I am uh, I'm reading from my um, from my book, which came out last year. It's called Boundless Deep and Other Stories. It's a story collection, uh, and uh, I was thinking about what to read, and I decided to pick this story uh, because it has a repeating structure, and so. If you at any point, you know, zone out for a second or two, <laughs> don't worry, the story's gonna come back. You can still follow along. <laughs> so there's that. Oh, and then the, the other thing I wanted to say uh, before I start, it's, it, the story is fiction, um, but um, I'm, I'm half Japanese and I was born and raised in Japan. And my, grand my Japanese grandparents, they uh, survived World War II as teenagers. So that's where that's coming from. Uh, it's called House Fire. On the day my grandmother started a fire in the kitchen, she talked of holding, which she had been doing for some time. The morning after New Year's, and the dispatcher asked my mother if she was sure it was an emergency. The fire station was short-handed, and the address my mother gave was at least half an hour away. My grandmother sat in her wheelchair and played with the snow under her slippers. She clicked her false front teeth in and out of her mouth. 
When I tried to flag down the fire engine from the nearest road, she hugged me and wouldn't let go. On the day my grandmother started a fire, she talked of holding and had been doing, for, doing so for some time. She had turned 82 in June and developed a habit of launching into sentences that seemed untethered from anything that had gone before. For about a year, she talked of the importance of holding. The left side of her body had been debilitated by a stroke some time before and was wasted and thin. Until then, she had worked a farm her whole adult life. On some days, the right side of her body contained incredible strength. On others, she was helpless. It was hard to say what accounted for the difference. She could move her left arm, but had no strength in the hand, couldn't lift anything with it. She liked to make a joke of it, called it Dameda Dameraro, a name like Batty McBadface, <laughs> gave it a voice, a child's whine, when she would lecture it on the need for grip, the importance of holding. Five years ago, she was cabled in muscle, drove crated cucumbers and dried persimmons in the back of her white van down mountain roads in every weather, taking the bank corners like a race car driver, hardly slowing down. Sorry, I'm going to take a sip of water. <laughs> On the day my grandmother started a fire in the kitchen, the dispatcher asked my mother if she was sure it was an emergency. The smoke started when a pot boiled down to nothing and sparked into flame. Soon it was in the grease cladding the ceiling and the tops of the walls, and there was nothing to be done. The kitchen had been recently remodeled, but the house was older than my mother, and there were no alarms. It was the morning after New Year's, and my grandmother had wanted to make osechi, a sweet soup that had been a favorite, been my favorite as a child of three or four. We'd started buying fancy crates of pre-made osechi ever since my grandmother's stroke. The food was for New Year's, but the leftovers often lasted for days. The prospect of an accident at the house had loomed like smoke over this arrangement for years. The question of how long my grandparents could last in this farmhouse on their own, the home health aides that insurance paid for three days a week, the neighbors who left gifts of leftover stew on the doorstep, how we lived so far away and could visit only so often, the danger we studiously ignored. Out in the snow, as we watched the smoke pour from the windows, the kitchen lit from inside like a lantern, I realized that my grandmother had lost her tether in time, that her strange asides were missives from years I didn't know. We waited for what felt like hours for the fire engine to come, but it was only 30 minutes. From time to time, neighbors came by to stare mutely at the house and couldn't seem to leave. On the day my grandmother sparked fire, she had been talking of holding for some time, maybe about a year. She had turned 82 and developed a habit of launching into sentences that seemed untethered from anything that had gone before. She said that a child of three or four must be held against the chest, never led by the hand. She inserted this information into conversations about groceries, the progress of the bypass construction over the valley, the unending hold of the Liberal Democratic Party over national politics. She categorized the drones of various taxi engines, semi-trucks, bullet trains on TV by aircraft type. Sikorsky, Mustang, B-29, but flying high, unloaded. In a crowd, if you lead a child by the hand, when people pack so close together it hurts, you'll be forced to lose them. This is what she said. Even bones burn blue, so from a distance you'll know. In cars and supermarket parking lots, my parents had started discussing an arrangement that my mother insisted on calling apartment living, a building in the nearest city where every bed had an alarm button and nurses would check in at least twice a day. She wanted to make ozoni in that morning as a way of proving that she was still capable, that she was worthy of independence. She shooed us out of the kitchen when we offered to help. The kitchen had been recently remodeled with a raised floor so she could sit in her wheelchair and still see into the pot, but the walls and ceiling were older than my mother and there were no alarms. Where my grandparents live, the ozoni is a sweet soup with mochi and a base of azuki beans. The beans have to be boiled for almost two hours. Maybe she lost those hours or added too little water or maybe she forgot to add any water at all. 
My grandmother on the day sparked fire in the kitchen for some time, maybe hours. She was 82 and untethered from years. On some days she was as strong as anyone, on others was lost. There was no accounting for the difference. In her youth, she coiled red ropes around her back and arms and sang work songs in the mud, plunged seedlings in neat rows with her cloth-covered hands. The songs were about the old myths of a time when the land was dew falling to the ocean off the point of a spear. Before that, she was a child in Osaka running from flames, had lived in mud atop the embers of her house in a neighborhood flattened by bombs. After that, she fled to farmland. She developed the habit of unhooking her front teeth from her mouth in moments of anxiousness. They were a bridge and never seemed to fit right. She had operated the winch when my grandparents pulled raw lumber up the mountain to build the farmhouse before my mother was born. A steel hook had come untethered from bark and snapped the coiled cable like a whip. She lost three teeth and bled all over the back of a motorcycle on the long ride to the hospital. She liked to make a joke of the false set, called them Dameda Damedaro, a name like Batty McBadface, gave them a voice, a child's whine in her clip. On the day my grandmother started a fire in the kitchen, she talked of holding a real emergency until there was nothing to be done. The fire station was short-handed, and the address my mother gave was at least half an hour away. We smelled the sugar burning and then the grease. We found my grandmother in the bathroom at the other end of the hall. Outside, the neighbors crowded and crowded in around us. My grandmother sat in her wheelchair and played with the snow under her slippers. Her mood was untethered like a child's. After what felt like hours, but was only 30 minutes, the fire truck climbed the nearest road, its engine droning under heavy load. The flashing lights turned the house red, then white. I tried to meet it, but my grandmother hugged me and wouldn't let go. A child of three or four, she said. The child was her. Her eyes were terror. Her hands were hooks. There was nothing to be done. The past gripped her and then released her. I know I can't live out here, she said, her slippers in snow. She was as strong as anyone. Thank you. see we've amassed a troop of actors who are also all very talented playwrights. Um, they write and perform, which I do not do, so I'll be, I'll be reading the stage directions. Um, this is a play called Wildfire, based on my experiences as a wildland firefighter. Um, we have a Mary, played by Alexis Elisa Macedo, Jesus Diaz, who play, is playing Marshall, um, a Wallace played by Nathan, uh, and I didn't do your last name, Nathan Hamilton. Um, Ma Ma Monaghan, played by Matt Tedekala, uh, T. Katala, and Nebraska, played by Davis Cower, and Brown, played by Jack Cummings. Um, this is uh, scene, uh, this is act two, scene two of the play, and um, Wallace, a rookie, is alone on stage uh, the red curtain behind us is a fire, and you, the audience, are what they're trying to protect. Um, a nighttime burn operation. Red embers float down to the audience as haze envelops them. Wallace stares upstage at a projection of the fire's inferno. He takes his helmet off and wipes his brow. He spots someone approaching. Wallace frantically dons his helmet and straightens up. Marshall and Nebraska enter. Marshall unholsters a flare pistol with his right hand while plugging his right ear with his off hand. He takes aim upstage at the fire. Firing! Marshall pulls trigger. Wallace, keep your eyes to the green. Marshall holsters the pistol. What? Turn around! Quit gawking at the fire. Rick, your job is to scan the green. Watch that unburned fluid behind our fire line. Wallace turns to the audience. Sorry. Don't be sorry, be better. <laughs> it's boring, but it's the most vital position on backburns. Tracking? Marshall takes out tobacco and papers and starts rolling a cigarette. Rolly? Yeah, sure. No, thanks. Good, so we have it. Marshall gestures to the audience while leaning on his Pulaski. 
Look at all that dry grass and beetle kill timber out there. All it takes is one little ember to get picked up by the wind and plant itself behind us, and we're cooked. Every time you see a tree torch, eyes to the sky. What's that? Watch out, 15. Wind increase and or changes direction. Marshall lights a cigarette and offers his papers to Nebraska. Good. He's been studying his response guide. That's the most important watch out. You know why? Why? Marshall loads another flare and cocks the hammer on the pistol. It's the number one cause for a blow up. It's, it's, it's the number one cause for a blow up. I was on the Yarnell fire in 13 when Granite Mountain shots got burned. 19 men gone in minutes. All it takes is one ember and that dragon will rear its nasty head. Don't want that, do we? No, sir. Firing! Marshall fires. You ever fire a flare pistol, Proby? I've never fired a gun before. We, we, we can't have that. Marshall hands the pistol to Nebraska. Show him, DB. Nebraska unhinges the revolver cylinder and dumps the casings. He loads six rounds and snaps the pistol closed as he speaks. These are blanks, not bullets. Uh, they kind of like fireworks, all bark and no bite, so don't get scared. They create enough energy to launch the flare into those pockets of green out there, help speed the back burn along. Nebraska loads a small flare into the barrel. Monahan and Brown enter. Monahan sets down a drip torch. Okay. Uh, come on, Soup. Are you letting the rookie shoot? Shot at Monahan. He's got to learn how to fight fire with fire. Here, light this. Marshall tosses the rolling papers and tobacco at Monahan. They never let the saw dog do the fun shit. Except you ain't no saw dog no more, huh? Last time I looked, a Mary was humping your saw for you. Wallace, you see that pocket of green out there? Yeah. Aim above it. That flare is going to arc, so you got to compensate for gravity. Wallace is shaking uncontrollably. Monahan lights a cigarette. You can't do it. You're scared of guns. Let me do it. Brown and Amari enter. Amari has a saw on her shoulder. How can you guys be smoking cigarettes with a fire right next to you? It's called being a hot shot. You type two deucer, wouldn't get it. Just trying to kill yourself as fast as possible, huh? Hey, knucklehead. You're smoking next to a damn drip torch. You trying to blow us all up? Step off, Monahan. He does. Sorry, Soup. Don't be sorry, be better. Copy. You got something to say, Monahan? No, sir. Good. We need you on the line hold. Take the rook spot. Eyes to the green. Go ahead. Monahan stomps out a cigarette and grabs the drip torch, steps down stage. I pull back that hammer and fire. Wallace struggles to cock the hammer. Go home now. Wallace fires the pistol with both hands. Monahan flinches. You're supposed to call firing. Do Monahan, sir. eyes to the green. Marshall takes the pistol. Good shot, kid. Gotta let people in the area know you're firing. Don't want to give them Forrest Gump here uh, war flashbacks, do we? Marshall punches Nebraska in the shoulder. Hell no, nah, Soup. That little 22, that's a damn toy. Good shot, Wallace. That pocket is filling in nicely. You can set your chainsaw down, Mary. Don't wear yourself out. All good, DB. You want to give her a go, Mary? Sure. You gonna let an engine slug shoot? Engine slug? Isn't that your saw sitting on her shoulder, Monahan? Yes, but she's half your size, too. Now that's a saw dog. Give her a go, Mary. Monahan st st storms off stage with the torch. Man, he's getting riled up over nothing. Too much pre workout. And Mary cocks the pistol one handed with the saw on her opposite shoulder. He's a damn workhorse, but he'll need thicker skin to be squad leader. And Mary shouts toward Monahan. Firing! Pulls trigger. Damn good shot, right in the pocket. You want a shot, Brown? I'm good. You already gave up meat. So tell me you gave up guns too. Nah, soup. Heard you had a close call the other day. Happens to everyone. Just don't go getting sauce on us. No, boss, just not feeling well. Get better quick. The roll ain't over and we got a nasty ridge to cut out tomorrow. Can't lose any more sawyers. Uh, Mary, bring the torch with you. Got a few miles to go. Eyes to the green rook. Marshall, Monahan, and Mary in Nebraska exit. Wallace turns to the audience. Brown stares into the fire. You all right, Brown? Yeah, I'm fine. Are you still serious about what you said yesterday? I don't know, thinking about it. You're the only guy on this crew I can talk to. The other squads will warm up to you a little, bro. Once you're out of your first fire, they'll treat you like a hot shot. Firing! A distant gunshot. Just be an easy, man. No, they don't, man. I'm not much of a sorrow, but I'm no good on the straight. I can't navigate that shit. Marshall hates me. He don't hate you. No, he told me at last year's end of the season party, after they announced that he was the new superintendent. 
came up to me blackout drunk and he told me to my face. Thought about quitting all winter. Maybe he's right. Maybe I've gone soft. That's bullshit, Brown. You're tougher than anyone I've met. You and Amari are working even better than when Monahan was you, your star partner. Every time I cut a tree, I imagine the worst. Not just for myself, I'm afraid I might get someone else killed. I'm sure. Firing! I Shot. can't get it out of my head. One botched cut, one misread lean, one widow maker I can't see. I never even wanted to be a sorrow. Just kept giving me the saw for some reason. You just need some time off. Like Nebraska said, maybe you could take the next fire assignment off. Take the fire off? You're kidding. Hot shots don't take mid-season vacations. Hell, Nebraska missed the birth of both his daughters and every birthday since because of the fire. You either face the shame and guilt of abandoning your team mid-season or you hot shot the fuck up. Which one are you gonna choose? I, I think, I think I might call it Mary. As soon as this fire is wrapped, they could pick up a Mary for the whole season. She's good, she's a better sorry than I am. Brown. Anyone tell you how Lang died? He died on a fire, right? It wasn't a fire. It was the winter that got him. They like to talk like he died heroically on the line, but the thing that nobody talks about is that he took his own life two weeks before our own return. That's why we hired you last minute. We don't normally bring on rookies. It's our fault he's dead. It's not your fault, Brown. All these men can't even say it out loud. We let him down, and we lay the blame on the fire instead. There's nothing we could have done. We spent six months traveling the country, sleeping in the dirt, and as soon as the season's over, we scattered to the wind. We can't wait to get away from each other. I mean, I should have checked in on him. It's just this endless cycle every year. These fires are getting bigger and bigger, and I feel like I'm wasting away. I gotta get out. Is it true that you backpacked the PCT and the ACT solo? Wallace rolls up his sleeve to show his tattoos. Got the ink to prove it. That must be scary when the mountain's all alone with the mice. You see other hikers sometimes. But I like being alone. I felt at peace. That sounds nice. Maybe that's what I need. A little bit of peace. Firing! Blackout. A shot heard farther away. Thank you.